So hi everyone, I'm Chris. Uh, like I said, developer at uh, Clearspring Technologies. Uh, there is a bunch of contact information there if you uh, want to say hi later. I'm sure one of those works for you. Uh, I've been working at Clearspring for like three and a half years now, spending most of my time on our um, sort of data and analytics team, building uh, distributed systems, um, fun stuff like that. Um, also fairly active in the Apache, Cassandra, and Kafka communities. So if you want to talk to me about those things, um, go for it. So this talks about um, sort of our process of as we were um, building some analytic, custom analytic systems over the years. Uh, since like the you know, intricate details of our own proprietary things aren't of like super interest to you, what I hope I succeed in um, emphasizing some of like the lessons we learned along the way uh, that hopefully are be helpful to you. Uh, and especially sort of like the trade-offs we made and how as like business conditions changed and requirements changed, uh, those trade-offs changed too. Um, cool. Or, uh, so Clearspring makes AdThis the world's largest social uh, sharing platform. You can go to addthis.com, uh, get the code. It'll make a nice little uh, button or toolbar on your site, a bunch of different um, uh, share, you know, sharing buttons. Um, and based on uh, the visitor's uh, language, geography, uh, what, um, what services they've used previously, we try to uh, display the uh, it's like best, best possible choice to get them to share your content and um, to, uh, send more people back to your site. Um, Cool, and more, more importantly than just that, we provide um, analytics about that. So uh, how many shares, how much traffic did those shares uh, drive back? Uh, what URLs are shared? What services are people using? Are people in different countries using different services? Because um, you, know, you know, Facebook's kind of popular in the United States. That's not necessarily the case everywhere. Um, and sort of most interestingly, we try to provide sort of like a, an audience breakdown in advertising terms. Are the people who are using your site are they interested in cars, cats, um, entertainment, things like that? How does that compare uh, both to people um, on your site and on other sites? And how does like the interest of the people sharing your content versus the people um, who come back and view the content from that, are, are those interests different? Is that, is that something that's meaningful for you for um, how you plan um, the work you do or what ads you want to show, things like that? Um, School. So by the numbers, add this is viewed about um, 2.8 billion um, times per day. Uh, buttons on about uh, 9 million uh, unique domains. And over the course of uh, about a month, uh, there's about 1 billion uh, unique users. Cool. So, so how we got there. So way back in 2006, for anyone who can, who can remember back that far, this is sort of like what was going on in um, sort of like well-known things and kind of distributed systems and analytics land. So Google's uh, you know, big table paper, uh, the Dynamo paper, which is really, really great. If you haven't read the Dynamo paper, you should, you should do that. Um, and just sort of like uh, the Hadoop project started um, earlier, but kind of graduated to like a, a top level project sort of around 2008. So in 2006, ClearSpring had this like widget platform. Um, we had like a little widget, and, and this was sort of uh, the bet that as web pages became more um, compartmentalized, it was less about a single page and more about the components on the page. Uh, so perhaps the publisher, the right thing to do was to make a uh, cool little widget that would be shared across the web and all these like social platforms and blogs and whatnot. Um, but we were doing um, analytics for those, those little widgets. Uh, and so sort of like the, the, the you know, great myth is that one Friday, the, the uh, sort of standard um, SQL type thing that was doing all these analytics fell over. So um, there was sort of this like prototype blog processing thing that over the weekend uh, was promoted and uh, kind of served since. And so the interesting thing there is that we were serving um, uh, like low, relatively low latency analytics. So if someone like viewed a widget or um, uh, shared it through one of like the social tours and that, it would show up in your your, your web page. You could log in to clearspring.com, and you would get get that uh, information within I don't know seconds to minute end to end, which at the time was 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 pretty cool. Um, and so like, a what if like is that something we should have emphasized more? Because that's you know the real time web is you know exciting stuff now. Um, so the original architecture was there was like one like super dedicated like widget processing cluster, um, and if you wanted like any sort of redundancy, where well, you set up an entirely you know separate redundant cluster, and if you wanted to process anything that wasn't like the widget data, you were kind of out of luck. Uh, so that obviously wasn't cool. So around like 2008, we started trying to generalize that with like the inputs we were processing, as opposed to just like this one special serialized like Java blob of widget data. We like sort of general like access logs. Um, and you know, so any, any sort of like data you can think of as, as a log in a line uh, that your applications might create. And sort of the idea behind this before it was these, um, so the limitation of the, like, the first prototype was that it was like all, all Java code all the way down. 
So if you wanted to like add a new report, uh, you were going and like writing brand new Java classes. There was no like declarative way to explain uh, what you were trying to do. Around 2009, we realized, or we knew earlier, but around 2009, we decided to do something about the fact that having like a dedicated cluster for like this one kind of analytics and this dedicated cluster for this like other kind of thing we weren't going to do wasn't uh, really economical. It wasn't what we wanted to do. We wanted uh, multi-tenancy where we could analyze multiple things in the same shared cluster um, and query them, query them both. And so the current work is kind of getting back to that original um, lower latency stuff, um, streams, so to speak, uh, trying to do like better so like node failure and allocation, so like standard distributed systems, like which, which node should have this data so that I have uh, an equitable distribution of work. Um, and so the question we're asking now is of how, um, wait, so we're, we're in bare metal, so on as uh, those boxes get bigger, how, how general should the cluster environment be? How, how hard should we push on multi-tenancy? Because um, as sort of like was talked about yesterday, the, the boxes are going to get bigger and bigger and harder and harder to, to utilize. So whether that's um, Yarn is like next generation Hadoop, it's going to be uh, sort of a more general uh, analytics platform. Mesos is kind of a kind of a cool research project in that in that other um, direction using like Linux C groups. So okay, so so back to the future. What's kind of like the da the data model for all these um, analytics things I've been talking about? So so, so not citing Wikipedia. Uh, way back in the 1960s, um, IBM introduced uh, their information management system on its mainframe computers. Um, and these were sort of a hierarchical thing. You had a tree of data, and you, you know, there, there wasn't like a, you know, a nice uh, SQL thing where you had tables, and those tables could relate to each other. You had a tree, and it was a hierarchy, and you could look through it one way. Um, this actually uh, isn't without... Um, isn't strictly inferior, it isn't without merit. So um, Charles Bachman in his 1973 Turing Word lecture um, argued that this uh, sort of navigable database where you have a tree or a graph and, the, and you can sort of like look down and explore through it was uh, a very good model of commuting, uh, computing uh, and how to look at information systems. Um, and he likened the earlier um, sort of primary key things where you do like a primary key lookup and then you got this memory location from you know, core back in the day, and then you've got this, this value back, that key value model uh, was both too, too primitive, too constraining, and sort of too uh, computer-centered. We should have like human-centered ways of things to do. And he likened uh, the change from that primary key lookup to these sort of like navigable databases as the same sort of like kind of change as going from a geocentric to a heliocentric view of the universe. Um, so. Obviously, we didn't know all of that when we started this project, but it's, it's been interesting to look back through the literature and try to see um, how, this, how this, these problems have been solved in the past. Um, and if anyone has like, other like, interesting like, 1960s database research on this topic, I would love, love to hear about it. Um, cool. So more practically, you know, a few years ago, uh, why, why did we choose this route? So why didn't we choose uh, some nice, expressive SQL-like query language? Uh, there were two basic, um, there were like business technical bets uh, one was that we, like as a business, did not want to be scaling vertically. Uh, not that at a problem that in 2006 or 2007 or, or you know, whatever, we couldn't possibly be scaled vertically. It probably could have on, on a SQL system, but we didn't want to be uh, the ones to find out, you know, here, here's the day where, where you can't buy, you know, disk any big, can't buy a big enough box or that box is just too expensive. So we, we didn't, we wanted to have the pain earlier rather than later. Uh, and sort of a bet that if we, we could charge something on top of, a, of a, some sort of like relational management system, and, but it would probably be a big time sink. Um, people, you know, people do it, right? You, this is this, you're not like these are technically like impossible things to do, uh, but it would be a big time sink, and what we ended up in the, the end would be um, not a relational management system. Uh, so sort of like the patterns you see, uh, I think Facebook has a very good description of how like they basically have like, you know, I know DB as like their, their key value store. Um, so we had a different bet. So why not a distributed hash table? Um, again, there's lots of like good good research here. There um, from the 1990s, like the Cord and Pastry papers, were really like foundational to a lot of uh, what we're doing today with these nice nice systems. Um, but uh, we felt that key value was too primitive, primitive, um, or too too difficult to be like the interface for the an application developer to try to build some of everything uh, up on top of themselves. So that was something the the database system should be trying to to expose something, something richer than just simple keys and values. And um, so the simple reason that the, there's, like today, there is this great um, set of HBase and React and Cassandra and other um, Bigtable and Dynamo-like storage systems that are really, really great. 
Uh, we're excited about them. Um, but they did definitely did not exist um, at the time, and many of them are solving. Um, they still have relatively, um, um, there's a limit to how much you can do with just a distributed hash table as, as your data structure. Um, but what we came up with was this, this sort of like middle thing, this back to this hierarchical database. Um, and we would try to um, declaratively explain um, the hierarchy. Um, so you have these paths through a tree, so to speak, that would be built up. So this is um, a slightly simplified version of, of a real job we run in production now uh, for like a, a product metrics um, tracking system. So at the top, there's a constant that gives like a name to the root so that humans kind of you know, know where they are. Um, we break this particular thing down by, by day. Uh, there'd be some product code, so and we're gonna have the, the cat camera product because everyone likes pictures of cats. Uh, you can measure some metric and measure that metric across a bunch of dimensions uh, that have different values. Um, cool, so, so here's our sample input file um, that is uh, extremely nicely formatted for us. So we have um, our cat camera application is sticking out a log file where we get um, like a date, um, what product it is, uh, what metric we're talking about, and um, two, two sort of like dimensions to measure across. In this case, uh, our, our cat camera says how many captions did people put on the cat, and how, how, how big was the cat picture. Um, so we can run, you know, run this job, um, run this job here, and we can you know start exploring. Uh, so um, we're at the root of the tree. We look down, and we see ah we got um, we got five packets. There were five log lines earlier. Um, the year, month, day, date, cat camera views, and we have uh, bytes and captions. So we can you know, click down, look at the bytes. So you can see the, um, the top there is sort of our, our path, like where we are on the tree here is what we're exploring and looking around. Uh, so under the bytes, we see the, these two values of how big our cat pictures were. Um, we can turn that into a query. Uh, the sort of, I mean, the details of the, the syntax aren't, aren't really um, too relevant here, but the we slow it down by slashes, just like any sort of like Unix file path. Uh, pluses like gather and you know, add, add a column. Um, and so and then we sort things together and merge them. So in this particular example, everything's on one node, so that wasn't really necessary. Uh, but what we do um, in general is the data will be shredded across a bunch of nodes uh, and do like a scatter gather and then have to sort and merge, merge the final results together. Um, Cool, and if we want to, we can do a slightly more complicated query that creates a pivot table for someone to look at in Excel. Because um, the you know, Excel people like that. Cool. So, so again, the data model is, is a much, like there are other trees that we can think of as, as data models. A Unix file system is a tree. Uh, Zookeeper Z nodes are also you know, a nice tree abstraction and the sort of um, really cool thing about files is you can put things in them. So elements in the tree can have uh, data attachments, and these can do sort of arbitrarily complicated and interesting things. Uh, so some examples are um, you can have a bloom filter uh, at, one, at a parent node, and then if you ask for a child, it'll first check the bloom filter before doing all the work to get at the child. Uh, you can have cardinality estimators. So this is again like a really cool piece of math that came out of like uh, academia and is incredibly useful for any sort of website that wants to do things like count unique users or unique URLs or things like that. Um, so if you have a, a, max, a set of some maximum size n max, like on a stars in the universe or URLs on the web or whatever, um, you can measure um, how many items you actually have in that set with only log log n bits, which is uh, very small, very compact, and way less than storing everything. It's, it's really cool. Uh, you can have like secondary counts. Um, so think of if your tree has like your URLs, maybe you want to count uh, hits and how for number of bytes served for that URL. Uh, it can do like time to lives. Uh, like a top or most frequent items in a, in a stream, or really any uh, serializable Java objects. So this is like one of the advantages uh, we had of doing our own thing um, was that you know we, you can add you know these <coughs> arbitrarily new attachments um, to do do some new thing that we need. Um, but it's not there are downsides, right? So you know it's just like the Postfix file system, right? Easy to use. Uh, that's really hard for like non-engineers to use in Grok, and uh, there's like there's own um, you know, that own like special syntax we have. Uh, so it's really hard, like the tooling isn't there. It's really, it's, it's often difficult even for engineers to use because uh, they can't just like go Google for like, please help me with my SQL query. Uh, it's something like we have to support in, internally. And it's, it's, I think it's a, 
if you go down this like path of doing your own thing and with your own data model, it's um, a lot of sort of like the downsides you run into are around like tooling and the ease of uh, bringing people up to speed. Um, and the other sort of downside is the the model of a hierarchical database, and it's a very very nice, very human centric model, kind of maps to how you think, where you say, you know, uh, to get here, go down the street, turn right, go down two blocks. If you've gone, if you see the um, dock in the harbor, you've gone too far, then turn left. Um, but that's deeply tied to sort of the structure of the tree or the street grid or whatever in the analogy, um, which means if you change the, the the tree, all of your queries have to change um, as well. So things are, are tightly coupled together. Not it's not. Um, not, perhaps not as declarative as, or it's a trade-off by not being as declarative. Um, so cool. So that's sort of like the, the theory of our data model and why um, we thought it worked. Uh, in particular, we thought it was nice to have like this middle ground between uh, these SQL row-oriented databases, where you tend to be thinking uh, stereotypically, right? Like pe people obviously think about both things. But how, how do I model my data without thinking of how I will access it, or like a column-oriented thing, where the only thing you're thinking about is how do I get at my data, uh, but that you can only get this data in that one way you thought of. So we found it kind of fits a, a useful middle ground both for um, serving like the queries to a live website and for people to kind of explore and look around and um, ask new questions about it. Um, so the, this, I'm gonna talk a little bit about like the system as it exists today um, and a little bit about like what's gone wrong. Um, so our, our whole stack, right, we have like, you know, products under that, there's like data analysis and, and there's queries uh, and there's and then just like a, a batch distributed system where we um, split log lines apart, do that, that tree, and there's that tree building uh, I talked about with those paths, and underneath that, which isn't what, what this talk is about, there's um, a distributed file system like thing where we just take flat files and shove them over TCP uh, to feed those splitters and tree builders. Um, so the overall process looks like this: we get in some um, raw log line from you know access log or some application specific log, something like that. It can be whatever format. Uh, we parse it out and turn it into um, some like, like nice self-descriptive format. We kind of have our own thing, but it's not like totally different from using Avro or, or like your favorite serialization framework uh, that, that gives you sort of um, a nice way to get your data without reparsing strings every time. Um, we shard that out, and there's um, uh, the tree builder goes and runs on that data, pulls in all the shards, builds a tree. And then a uh, user can you know, make some queries and they get something out back in the end that, remember, look kind of like a table again. Um, and if you want, you can go for a full circle and use that as the, the input for a new process. Um, cool. So, um, so when we, we split data in, we get an incoming line, end lines go, uh, go out. It's not a particularly complicated process. Um, one cool thing is that while we usually just shard by the, the primary key, right, we, we get in some data, we're gonna shard it by domain or URL or whatever, um, user ID, session ID. Uh, we can shard it by like an arbitrary function, um, which can in some cases be useful to do uh, to make sure you get like an even distribution because um, things like domains and, and URLs do tend to be kind of like lumpy. It's hard to get an even distribution of them. Um, and Shiver again runs, it gets in data from that, that split sharded data and runs and builds a tree. Uh, so sort of the, the, the important point of how, how there's this two-step process is that when we're building a tree, uh, we can reason about what, what subset of the data uh, we have. So that um, if we sharded by URL, for example, we can be confident that all of these sessions associated with that URL um, are also being seen by this partition. Um, and can then you know, look them up from, like, you know, build a tree of sessions and look them up if we need to um, do some sort of compound operation. And so on disk, both, both of those are like splitting jobs and tree building jobs. Um, the file format looks like this. So there's like this live directory or scratch directory where the jobs actually run. Um, you know, do their thing for you know, an hour or five minutes, however long they're set to run, however long they have data to process. Uh, they then shut down. If they shut down cleanly and correctly, like bash gets the right error code back. Um, that um, directory is then copied over one of the, the two previous, or sorry, we create a new backup directory, so the, this would be like uh, some tiny U, UID type thing, and we delete the oldest one so you can have a fixed number of backups, um, in this case two, and we'll use a symlink to mark the, the most recent one um, for, for applications that need to know that. Um, one of the, the cool things we did here is, um, so there was this guy who was kind of, who was tired of um, 
his like Linux uh, kernel checkouts taking up too much space on disk like five years ago. It was like this, you know, this very sort of like uh, strange like itch to have. So he wrote uh, an LD preload copy on write um, facility uh, that runs on Linux and is really cool. Um, so these backups are, um, we're not keeping like three total copies of the data, it's um, the sort of like live scratch directory and then two, um, or, and cop copy on write um, backups, which takes up way less of the space, um, which is, is you know, great for us, right? If we usually have um, three, three, three backups, we don't usually you know, change things too often, right? Um, we get, you know, not only using a third of data if we were, if we were taking for um, flat backups, which is pretty cool. Um, So the, the model, right, so we have, we build all these discrete trees on these different distributed nodes, um, and each, each, um, each node um, has its own little view of the tree, has no idea what's, it just knows like I'm partition five or whatever, right, has no idea what other nodes are. Uh, so there's like a, a query master node in front that does a simple scatter gather across all of them, gets the result back and aggregates it, and that's what we saw in that, that demo earlier. Um, which is, which is sort of like the, the cool advantage here is that the, um, since the different processing jobs don't have to coordinate each other, they can all run at their own pace or individual tasks can fail separately and while the others continue forward. There's no um, like bulk synchronization of, of steps. Um, and putting it all together, so there's a bunch of sort of like slave minion nodes um, that have like a query slave, one of those file server things running on it. They're running you know, one, between like zero and n jobs at any particular time. Uh, there's that like master like query node that knows you know you go through to query everything, and there's a little like there's a master like node that's running all of the jobs, and all of them uh, coordinate through um, Apache Zookeeper. Um, is that dude in the right? Cool. So so that all sounded fun and cool, um, but some things that um, didn't work out so well are things we've we've sort of struggled with. So sort of like really obvious statement um, is that um, backwards compatible distributed systems, like distributed systems to begin with are, are not easy, right? They tend to be um, hard. They tend to like look easy until that your network is partitioned or I don't know, midnight rolls around, something slightly different happens and they tend to break. Um, so getting them right to begin with is hard and then getting them backwards compatible is um, particularly difficult. So we've often had the case where we have like three different clusters and those clusters will end up with uh, wildly different forks of the code because uh, we didn't have like didn't put in the resources to make sure we could um, always clean upgrade them, or we're betting like this this new fork is the best fork, so eventually we'll replace it once it's totally stable. Um, cool. Um, so the consequence of that is that um, like that that backup system I talked to you about earlier, right? So we talked about like cool data models, um, scatter gather trees. So sort of, I think the most important thing there uh, was how do we deal with failures of the running processes? Uh, so so the responsibility is on the running job to do, do like the standard Unix thing, and if uh, I was successful, give me a good error code, otherwise exit with something that says, you know, something bad happened, uh, don't wipe away a backup with me. Um, and so the piece I didn't give you is that this is all written in Java, and Java has checked exceptions. Um, sorry, how, how many people like Java programmers run something on the JVM? One, two, one, okay. Uh, so checked exceptions are exceptions where you have to say this thing throws an exception, and then someone calling it is responsible for handling it. Um, and this tends to be something that programmers don't like, find very difficult, and they usually just wrap their exception in some sort of like runtime thing, uh, ignore it all the way up to some like top level logging handler and keep going. Uh, so it's very, very difficult, including with like libraries, to get a clean disciplined code base uh, where all the exceptions are handled in some way, where your top level thing can say, uh, this, this exception is really, really bad, uh, this job is, is bad, you know, terminate it, do not like go, you know, exit one, right? Um, so we had a situation where we had, um, we were doing some like migration of like some backend SAN things, um, and the, the, the cluster there was using, using the SAN for something like ridiculous and unnecessary, like moving jars around or something. Um, but it had been doing it for a while, it's like a legacy thing we didn't want to change, and we thought we would be really clever and cool, and when we moved to the new boxes, we would give them the same DNS name uh, so that it would be transparent and everything would be great. So we switched DNS to the new boxes, everything seemed great for, for about a day, uh, so we said, cool, success. We shut down the old boxes. Um, and a few minutes later, we realized that the cluster was hung. Uh, it turns out NFS on all of the different boxes uh, went, had never really, had cached DNS indefinitely or never really bothered to take the update. 
Uh, so we're going to then look to the other boxes. It kind of froze in some terrible, hard, unrecoverable way. So if you like tried to LS, uh, your LS would hang indefinitely, and you'd kill it, and it would still hang, and you'd kill mine, and it would still hang. And you were like, well, this is really inconvenient because I can't type LS in my home directory. Um, so that was sort of like the first thing that went wrong. So all the jobs were in some like bad zombie state. Um, they were difficult to, uh, like the Druva system was like, I, I do not understand what is going on. This job says it's running, but this other job says it's not running. Um, so we sort of like manually, like, okay, we'll kill all the jobs. Um, the human uh, doing that, that would be me, perhaps was overzealous and hit kill nine. Uh, so all the jobs were bad, we restarted all the boxes, NFS seemed to work. The job started running. Um, so at this point, we had like one uh, backup was, was bad, sort of like from the, the zombie node fiasco, and then like there was one good backup. Uh, so we restarted everything, they ran. Uh, the sort of checkpoint, or sorry, the sort of like fail safe that was supposed to say, this job is terrible, I should not run and I should exit again with one, so we know something terrible happened, uh, didn't work. Um, so the job kind of ran through a bunch of errors and exited saying everything was fine and rewrote the second backup, uh, which meant we had like a bad live scratch directory and two bad backups, uh, which was uh, very sad. Um, so I talked about like, like, like again, like, like data monitors and hierarchy and navigatable explorers and things like that. Uh, but I think the really the most important decision in this system was how do we handle uh, this failure case where we rely entirely on um, being able to detect the failure um, and hopefully we undetect it within like end runs so we didn't overwrite all of the backups. And it turned out that um, detecting failure wasn't really as, as easy as we thought it would be, especially in a language like Java where you have all these like spurious like null pointer exceptions or something deep in a library and it's hard to say, well, I don't know, there was this one, like I wouldn't want to like die if there was one malformatted line, but we want also to um, you know, exit if the data is uncorruptible and unreadable. Um, so I think that's sort of a, a difficult um, unsolved uh, like sof uh, software engineering problem in sort of like JVM land. Like how do I clearly differentiate these really, really bad errors like these, I don't know, uh, from these um, sort of everyday things that you have to live with with a large code base, um, you know, reading a lot of like unclean internet data. So, cool. Other sort of more um, miscellaneous things that are wrong. So we use the file systems for, for backups. There wasn't like a quorum write to a bunch of distributed nodes. Uh, there was the, ma the running master one, and then we rsync to, um, when that checkpoint completes, we then rsync to um, another directory or copy and write if it's local. Uh, the sort of downside there is that that's uh, extremely unfriendly to the operating system's page cache, because rsync reads all this data uh, that it's never gonna read again, and then writes all this data that it's never gonna read again and both of those operations were probably reading and writing far more data than the RAM, so your entire page cache has been shot. And uh, like the latency um, and performance of your queries were you know, dropped um, while it's running, uh, which is sad. Um, so sort of like a secondary confident, um, consequence. We went with like this very large checkpoint granularity on an order of like you know, minutes, hours, whatever, however long the job is running, as opposed to this sort of, um, if you had some like database system where you would like create a checkpoint on every, every quorum write. Um, like low latency and especially jitter is hard to, um, or at least we find difficult to get um, as a consequence of all this multi-tenancy uh, where the nodes trying to serve up like low latency queries to our website are also running all these like background, um, like you know, sequential reads and writes table spans, processing things. Um, and I think uh, this is sort of a more general challenge going forth as we need to make more things multi-tenant, run more things on one nodes uh, but how to, and the CPU like scheduler is, you know, does a pretty good job. If you're like, I have eight cores, but I'm gonna run like 16 like, um, you know, CPU bound processes, the OS scheduler will generally do a pretty good job of like making something reasonable about that. But if you're like IO saturated, you don't have more IOPS, uh, at least we find, especially like in Linux, like the completely fair scheduler isn't really that fair. You're not really able to give one process meaningfully better priority over the other. Um, and I think that's a challenge sort of for everyone as we move to these larger multi-tenant systems, whether it's through hardware virtualization or um, something else. And the other thing is we, we made this decision that we were gonna allow arbitrarily complicated partitioning. Uh, we could run like, as opposed to just like a primary key hashed, uh, you could hash a bunch of keys, you could run, you know, do, do whatever you want. Um, but the downside of that is that you can't, it's really hard to explain that knowledge back to the, the query system to do something like, so we have this like scatter gather, right, where which works great on like, dozens of nodes or you know, maybe 100 nodes, but probably on 1,000 nodes would not be so great. 
um, you would really, your latency would really be bound by this like one slow node or this one, you know, one node that you know, just responded later. Um, and it's, what you really like to do is only query the nodes you know could possibly have data based on the sharding and partitioning. Um, how you know any any sort of like nice ring system works, for example, um, from Dynamo. Uh, that's hard to do, but there are the trade-offs we've made. Um, and the other is that uh, this is sort of a, a you know, more general problem with any system where um, you're, you're you know like uh, you know. You know, using like a bunch of like key value stores for very specialized things, or um, in this case with our with our paths, that if you decide you need something new, you have to go back to the original source data and re pre compute everything um, again. Cool. So sort of like final um, concluding thoughts or um, lessons learned: um, data models, whether they be rows, columns, trees, um, you know, whatever data um, relational SQL, you know, what have you, change how you think. So just as we um, it's important to be like a polyglot programmer to know more than one programming languages and more than one paradigm um, to sort of expand um, like you, what you as a software engineer are capable of. It's, I think it's important to think of like more than one data model um, so that when you can approach these problems, you can um, like better choose like what, what fits correctly for what I'm doing. Um, there is, so that there's, right, there's, there's always, you know, people have like a not invented here thing, I wanna do everything myself. But I think there's, there's this sort of other extreme that, um, some people fall into where we view existing systems, whether they be Hadoop or something else, sort of immutable Lego building blocks for us, with us just being able to assemble them together. Um, I would say, like, you know, systems research is not over. Uh, it can be the right thing to, to write your own, and um, ideally write your own and then like, you know, write a paper about it or come you know, share it at Surge or something like that. Because um, I think there, there's, there's interesting work to be do that you know, existing systems do not um, handle. And the last thought is that uh, systems that operate in the order of, of hours um, are sort of like fundamentally different from systems that you know, want to respond within like a millisecond or sub-millisecond. I think that's not um, a controversial statement. Those systems are so like fundamentally different. They need to make fundamentally different trade-offs. Uh, but what about systems that need to operate in the order of thousands of milliseconds in a second or minutes? How, how different are those? Should we have like four different kinds of systems for hours, minutes, seconds, and milliseconds? Or should we have like two, three? Like what, what's the right... Um, right design space there, and I think that's something as a, more people are looking into more like low latency web systems that um, we're gonna be exploring in the future. Uh, if you think this stuff is super fun, um, ClearSpring is hiring, and we'd love to you know, talk to people about distributed systems. Um, but otherwise, uh, thanks for listening, and uh, are there any questions? Go ahead. Um, so, so two sort of, one, um, so the, like the obvious difference, right, it's not, it's not a graph, it's, a, it's somewhat more limited, it's a tree. Um, the other is sort of like the, the problem space it's attacking, usually with a graph database. Um, I'm really interested in calculating, um, so like connections of nodes and from this like node, uh, like what are the, like the weights of all nodes into it or something like that, and um, sort of, per, Partition, you know, partitioning a graph across distributed nodes is sort of like a, like a difficult problem, right? Sort of like a, graphs are like notoriously difficult to partition, particularly if you want to do those sort of things where you're, you're, you're um, using them as, as a network. Um, but in our case, we're not, really, we're not really calculating like flows through a tree or something like that. Um, so we can, you know, it's easier to distribute the tree and also um, the things we're doing are usually, um, you know, we're like adding together counts from different nodes which are associated and commutative and have all those nice properties. Uh, so that we can you know, scatter or gather to a bunch of different things and combine them together at the end. Um, and I don't think you can necessarily, you can like partition a, a graph, um, like, you know, you know, with a hash randomly and then like try to calculate a flow and combine that and get anything meaningful out of that. Um, so that's what I would say the, the difference is. Cool. Any other questions? Okay.